Jo, she's got the, the uh, sort of unfailing cough. Um, Ray, has that, Ray has that as well, along with a sore throat and an eye infection. Um, and so, uh, Paul is not well. So, so we've got food people away, haven't we? So, um, never mind, we're all right. We can sit together if you want. <laughs> So, yeah, so never mind, we're all here and the Lord is here, that's good, isn't it? And we've got, put the notices up, shall we? Just yes. go through them quickly, please. And, and there is one little alteration on the sheet here, the sheet, it's the soup and roll, it's the 13th of February, yeah? Should be the 13th of February. Soup and roll. Okay, well, um, Joe just told me that little Josh was home for a, <clears throat> for a short while, but he's going to go back to the hospital probably early in the week, so we'll keep praying for Joshua. Um, Pray that um, that situation can soon be resolved. Um, Stephen, it's good to see Stephen here, that he's sick again, so he's, he's on the road to recovery. And Nick has got his operation very soon. <laughs> next Monday, not tomorrow, but the next Monday is Nick. Yeah. Okay, so remember, Joy's mum. And uh, we spoke to uh, uh, Mark, uh, or Sinead, uh, Kaywin, sorry, <laughs> Kaywin, <laughs> Jeremy. Um, and she says that um, he, he's, sort of, he's better than he was before they found out what was wrong with him, but he's still having this um, kidney dialysis, I think it is, a couple of times a week, and that's absolutely sort of destroying him when he has it. So I said, well, we would remember Jeremy anyhow in our prayers too. And, of course, there's two topics that we did continue to pray for on a regular basis, peace in Palestine and peace in Ukraine and Russia. Um, the ladies' meetings on the 15th of February as well, and still this meeting here, I know one or two people have um, said they're interested in going, so keep it up, keep up with that. And then we've got these ones. The, the, the um, association has put out these prayers for uh, this week. Uh, it's for the pastors that they'll preach with boldness and courage and faithfulness to God's word, being led by the Holy Spirit. Boy, do we need that these days. Yeah? And, we, and as I, I think, you know, we did pray for itinerant preachers, but it's just the same, you know, that they might be filled with... Uh, a refreshed and renewed in strength. But you see, when you go on Sunday, you think, well, it's not too hard, but there's a lot more going to just stand and up for a while on a Sunday. You've got to get ready at home. And it can be a little bit exhausting. I'm sure some speakers, you know, like, they find it quite exhausting. So we need to pray for the ministers in the church. Um, and that's another one. They remain humble, loving, and compassionate to those they serve and lead. And they need wisdom and discernment for all the situations that they clearly see God's direction and be encouraged. So pray for the pastors in the association and, and you know others like a Nick Field and that who we know they all need our prayers, don't they? I think there's another note as well, isn't there? Perhaps there's something I've got to remember. Well, it comes to like... in the list, the persecuted church. Oh yes, yeah. have you noticed on the persecuted church church um, we we're going to pray for Nigeria this month. Um, if you look on the uh, World Watch list uh, and look what's happening in Nigeria, there's some terrible situations there. I know um, a couple of years ago, Hannah, my daughter, came and gave us an update on what's happening in Nigeria. But reading and watching the news, I think it'd be good if I can get her along to give us another little update on what's happening there. Because I know that's the country that she particularly focuses on for, um, uh, what was it? Open doors, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> so um, I'll try and get her to come along and give us a talk on that again. But you've got the, got the list there, so read through them as well. And I know that um, Dalsia a missionary in Peru. She's gone through a particularly difficult time as well, so remember her too. Um, before we go any further, I just want to read, read the psalm. If you've all got a Bible, if not, I'll get one. I don't want to hold it. Just listen to it. Psalm um, 139. We'll take up the offering in the first hymn. Okay, it's the first Sunday, so we'll take up the offering in the first hymn. Psalm 139. <laughs> And I know that we all know this, but it's good to go through it again. <clears throat> and um, today, we're going to have a little look into 2 Samuel chapter 8. Then we're going to jump onto my well, little passage I want to do about Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth eats at the king's table. And as you can see, we have the Lord's table right here. We're going to eat at the king's table. We're going to share communion together a little later in the service. Anyhow, let's just uh, read this Psalm 139. We'll read um, up to verse 14. 
O Lord, you have searched me and known me. <clears throat> you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Since knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the outermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day, and the darkness is the light that both are like to you. For you form my inward parts, you've covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. So we've got an all-knowing God. He made us, he knows all about us, he sees us, we can't escape from him. It has to give us comfort, doesn't it? Also, sort of, I suppose it makes us shiver a little bit to think that God knows all our little in those secrets as well, doesn't he? He sees right into those little dark corners of our hearts and lives as well. But it's great to know that God watches over us, he sees and knows everything about us. And he does care for us. We belong to him. We're his forevermore. Let's have a prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you that we can come together this morning, gather around your word, we can sing the, the hymns, the songs together, Lord, we can praise and worship you, we'll be gathering around the Lord's table, we'll share fellowship there as well, Lord, we thank you for that. And we do just remember our friends who have normally been with us, those who are unwell, we pray for them especially this morning too, Lord. We pray your spirit will be with them, just as you've promised it will be with us, and may we sense your Holy Spirit amongst us, Lord, as we go through this time this morning. Father, we just ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So don't forget, we'll take the offering up during the first hymn, and we're going to join together and sing that now. Over all the earth you reign. Oh, yeah, it's right. Yeah, yeah. Got both of it. Oh, okay.
voice ways, Lord, that we can sing to you and praise you. But, Lord, we also bring to you this morning this offering. And we thank you, Lord, that you do oversee us, that you bring in the things into our lives that we may take out of it to give to you. So, Lord, we, we thank you now for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 you and say to you, I want to be a Christian or I want to learn more about Christianity or how do I become a Christian, what Bible verses would you use? What Bible verse would you be able to remember? What Bible verse would you sort of have at hand? Um, so I know some people sort of have some and some people don't. And I thought it would be a good idea if we just had a Bible verse that we could make. It's an underline in our Bibles and I'll go through one or two over the next few weeks. But verses that we could use to people to explain what we believe and why we believe it. And so, if you've got a pen, just mark it in your Bible, John 3, verse 5 and 7. Because these, these are essential verses, right? And uh, it's the start. If you want to talk to people, it's a good place to start and then follow on from there. You know, it's just the words of Jesus, what he says. Look, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. That's, that's essential for anyone who wants to become a Christian. You must be born again. And there's just a good verse to have by Learn it. Well, you know, if you put it back somewhere over a week or two, you write it out a few times, you'll learn those words. You'll know them. And if you can remember the Bible reference and you'll talk to somebody from your Bible, how much easier that will be. And we'll put some more up uh, over the next few weeks. But... You know, if you can, just make a note of that. It might be your neighbour, it might be your, your brother, your sister, your grandson, your granddaughter, whoever it could be. It could be anybody, but it's just good to have a Bible verse to turn to and you can sort of speak to them from the Word of God. So, John 3, verse 5 to 7, this week. So, you have to say, the line that you can. Well, I'm going to ask Mike just to leave, leave us in prayer for a moment, maybe before we can get on through the end. So Lord, we thank you now that we can come together, join together this day, to praise you, worship you, to hear your word, to encourage one another. And Lord, we can't do this without your spirit living within us, so we thank you for that gift, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you speak to us and share with us individually, as well as corporately. We've got so much to thank you for. And Lord, you do think of those who are not well today, but Lord, again, your spirit moves amongst them who love you and know you whether they're at home or whether they're here. And you know people's circumstances as well. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for you walking on this earth, Lord. To show us that you really do know us. You've lived a life that showed that you know our pains, our upsets, our joys. Our moments of concern. And yet, Lord, you, you walk with us and show us each day. If only we have ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, there is so much going on at the moment, it's hard to pray in some ways, when we just look at the world situation. And we do offer up to you these things across the world, Lord. From the Middle East, Lord, right through Europe, in America, with the things that's happening in Texas and all the other states, Lord. Things that many of us would never have dreamed could have imagined in our lifetime. And yet we're seeing these things unfold, Lord, with all the earthquakes, the flooding, the volcanic eruptions, Things that are not even reported in the news that we don't even know about. And yet are happening. We've heard this morning, Lord, of Christians being persecuted in Nigeria, but in other countries as well, Lord. And Lord, it could easily overwhelm us. But I thank you, Lord, that we keep our eyes on you, Jesus. Because, Lord, when we keep our eyes on you, we can thank you for your scriptures that show us so often throughout history where far worse things have happened at times. And your hands being upon you. From the moment of your birth when you made <coughs> leaders bringing the tax thing just to get you in the right place to be born, which they would never have realised was happening. And Lord, right through history when there's been wars and terrible things happening, your hand has been over it all. Just looking at that picture this morning, Lord, of 
the parted waters, Lord, that we read of Exodus, Lord, and your hand was over Moses and those people, Lord, in an impossible situation with warriors coming down to kill them and take them back to slavery. And yet, Lord, you've allowed that all to happen. You allowed those people to be fearful, to cry out, because you wanted them to turn to you more, Lord, to show you, in the end, that they love you because they realise what you offer us. So Lord, let us not be a people that have to be put in a corner. Let us be a people, Lord, that turn to you easily, in faith, and that we encourage one another, Lord, when we're down, to always keep our eyes on you. So Lord, really this prayer is a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer to thank you, even though we could spend hours praying over these terrible situations. Lord, let our eyes focus on you, because your hands are over us, and teach us, Lord, how to pray for those situations. The ones that you want us individually to pray for as well as corporately. Let us not wander off on our own fleshly thoughts. So I thank you, Lord, that we can come before you this morning, before your throne. And Jesus, you take this to the Father. And thank you, Father, for listening to your Son and the words he takes to you from us. So, Lord, it's beyond us. It is beyond us. But what hope, Lord. And we thank you for that. Amen. 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 Um, well, I'm going to cheat a little bit on where we're going today because we're going through two seconds. If you can turn with me to two seconds, you know, I'm going to skip a chapter, but we're just going to go through. I'm going to read it through just so you can't say we didn't do it. <laughs> um, we, we, we went through 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7 last time, and um, if you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David had the desire to build a, a temple for the ark of God. But the Lord said to him, look, you're not the one to do that for me. Um, it's going to be one of your sons, one of your descendants will do that. You know, David was upset that he was sitting in a nice house with cedar panels and the ark of God was in a tent. Uh, but God said, no, there's going, to be, there's going to be somebody else to do that, not you, but there's still plenty for you to do. And when we get to um, chapter 8, there's really a list of the things that... Uh, David does. So it's not really like, well, you know, I want to read through it just so we know what happened, okay? There's a list of several things there, and then we can move on to David chapter 9. Um, so I'm just going to read it through, chapter 8. It says that, uh, this is after God had said that he was going to build a house for David instead of David building a house for God. And it says, after this it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Mathagamar from the hand of the Philistines. Then he defeated Moab. Forcing them down to the ground, he measured them off with a line. With two lines, he measured off those to be put to death, and with one line, one full line, those to be kept alive. So the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. David also defeated Hadadazer, the son of Rahab, the king of Slavar, as he went to recover his ter territory at the river Euphrates. And David took from him 1,000 chariots, 700 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came up to help Hadadazer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in, the Syria, in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. <coughs> so the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that belonged to the servants of Hadadazer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Beta and from Barathai, cities of Hadadazer, king David took large amounts of bronze. When Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated the whole army of Hadadazer, then Toi sent Joram, his son, to King David to greet him and to bless him, because he had fought against Hadadazer and defeated him. For Hadadazer had been at war with Toi, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, gold, and bronze. King David also dedicated these to the Lord, along with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had to do, from Syria, from Moab, from the people of Ammon, from the Philistines, from Amalek, and from the spoils of Hadadaz, and the son of Rehob, the king of Zobah. And David made himself a name when he returned from killing 18,000 Syrians in the Valley of Salt. He also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered judgment and justice to all his people. Joab, the son of Zariah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ali Ahilurah, was recorded. 
Zadok, the son of Adad, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. Zeruiah was the scribe. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over both the Perathites and the Pelathites, and David's sons, the chief ministers. So you could see that he was busy. <laughs> he had a lot to do, didn't he? And David. And um, um, but verse 2 just stood out to me and when I was reading this at home. Um, the same thing has been a rather violent little um, episode of David's life where he measures out the, the, um, the forces of Moab with a measuring line and he puts to death two thirds of them. Um, and if you remember, David is associated with the Moabites because Ruth was his great grandmother, I believe, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah, he threw through Ruth and he was associated to the Moabites through Ruth. And uh, also, if you remember, when uh, he was under pressure from Saul, and Saul was probably seeking all his friends, he took his parents to live in the land of Moab. And some commentators actually think that it was because... Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> some think it was because that his parents uh, may have been mistreated by the Moabites, that David was rather harsh on them. Um, but remember, if you go through the Bible, that uh, God actually had a little bit of a a crusade against the Moabites. And one of the reasons was that um, back in Numbers, uh, I think 22 to 25, you can read the accounts of uh, Balak, king of Moab. He, he, uh, tr he tried to hire Balak to uh, curse Israel. Uh, but instead of pronouncing curses, uh, the prophet pronounced blessings on Israel. And uh, also, uh, it was the Moabites who did, seduced the men, of, um, uh, the men of Israel at Acacia Grove. And so there was always this ongoing um, sort of enmity between Moab and God. And, and as you look at this, most kids would probably have um, slaughtered all of the, um, the opposing army, but David spared one third of them, and he settled to take a tribute from the nation. And it was really, if you get time to go home and you read about Numbers um, 24, 17, you'll see that this actually is probably an, in fulfilment of um, uh, what uh, Balaam prophesied, because he said in his prophecy, he said, Now I see him, but not now, and be I behold him. But not near, a star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and batter the brow of Moab. And that's what happened here in this passage here, in that verse there. So we have had a quick little skim through that, and after we've shared communion, we'll move, move on to uh, chapter 9, which is Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth is the man who has nothing, and he ends up dining at the Lord's table. And that's where we are, isn't it, when we come round to the communion table. We're sort of unworthy, yet we can come and share this before the Lord. So we're going to sing a, another song now, and then uh, we'll go and we'll stand around the Lord's table. Oh 
disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to the Passover? And he said, Go to the city, uh, to a certain man, and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover in your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful. And each one of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for him if that man had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said, You have said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he took the cup, he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they sang a him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Paul had instructed the Corinthians on all of these things. We've been going through that on Wednesday night. And they had been abusing the Lord's table. And he had to remind them of just how important it was when they shared communion together. And he says, you know, he says to them, I want you to sort of be very careful how you, how you go about this, you know, consider your own situation. He says, um, because that's for, Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing. We're remembering the Lord's death and we're proclaiming it. He says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink the cup. For whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment upon himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So let's have a moment or two of silence. It's so up to each person individually to discern whether they're right to share communion at the moment. And so we have a moment of silence where we examine ourselves and make sure that we're right with the Lord before we do that. And then Mike will lead us in a prayer for the bread, please. <coughs> Lord, we thank you that you hear these prayers. You see our hearts, but you also hear our thoughts and our desire to be forgiven completely. That we may take this bread and wine this morning. And Lord, we thank you for this bread. It shows your broken body. And Lord, none of us can really enter into what you went through. But Lord, we have thoughts, we have ideas, we have what we've read. And Lord, it's beyond us. But Lord, we want to thank you for that sacrifice you made. And Lord, help us to walk ever closer to you. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in sanctifying us. But Lord, as we take this bread now, we remember your broken body, but also the promise you've made to us now. And we walk and stand in those promises. Amen. Amen.
later this morning, we'll be looking at Mephibosheth as well. And um, Fred Catherine, I'll just about talk this time for now. But uh, we'll be looking at that Mephibosheth, who was a man who was re uh, raised up to the king's table because of the covenant. And we're going to share this the blood of the wine, and this, the, the symbol of the blood of the man. Which reminds us of the covenant that was the covenant was made by the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here because of that covenant. That covenant was written, it was signed, it was sealed, it was delivered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that covenant, which can't be broken, we are able to share this. And one day we will share it, as we just read earlier from Matthew, fully in the presence of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So as we take the cup, let's retain it, let's hold on to it, and we'll all drink together to show our unity <coughs> In the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus, my eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me, and from my smitten heart with tears to wonders I confess, the wonders of redeemed love and my unworthiness. Let's give Jesus the praise and the glory. Okay. Okay. Um, and 
you will all the songs. Okay. <coughs> okay, so it's a worship service, really, then? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then down at the bar. Because they, they, have, they have a meeting down there anyhow, don't they? So, yeah, okay, so if anybody wants to get along, Sunday the 25th at 6.30, down at Coombs Lane, at uh, Philip Hart's farm at the bar now. Okay. <laughs>
controls the, the whole scenario here, the whole situation. Um, he puts the people and places and events in order, and it shows us God's mercy, God's love toward, you know, towards each one of us, what he's done for us. Um, there's a hey, the picture of a two hands holding the world. We used to sing that chorus. Um, he's got the whole wide world in his hand. So God's got more than that, hasn't he? He's got, the, he's got everything, everything to hand, just the universe as well, you know, and all the universe and everything. And he's got not just um, the little baby, but he's got kings in his hands as well. So as we read through 2 Samuel uh, chapter 8, last um, time uh, today, and um, chapter 7 last time, we saw how um, David is firmly sort of established as the king of Israel. God has subdued all his enemies. Um, the kingdom is organised, structured. He's got, we saw, you can see that, you know, in those last verses of chapter 8, it tells you who the ministers are, who's over the army, etc. Um, and, and everything is sort of um, peaceful in as much as I've never had wars or battles, but for the ordinary civilians, I should imagine, this probably got to be one of the most peaceful times in the life of Israel. God, uh, God has established David, and he, he has the power and authority to keep uh, peace and, and to give people a decent life as well. And as David sits back and reflects, you know, in his, he seems to have done that in that uh, chapter we looked at before, he sits back and reflects, right? and he, he says in verse 1, Is there still anyone who's left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, um, Saul knew David was a great threat to the throne. We've gone all through that, haven't we? And given the chance, he would have killed David. Saul would love to have got rid of David. On the other hand, as we've gone through the story, we saw that David had the opportunity to kill Saul more than once. But he never took it because he realised, he, well, he wouldn't lay a finger on Saul because he realised that he was God's anointed. And he never took advantage of those situations. And God had said to David, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with him. And God had fulfilled his uh, promise there. And, and um, Saul and his sons had been killed on Mount Gilboa and David wasn't responsible for any of that bloodshed. So they, they, they'd all been removed. And we, you remember um, a couple of three weeks back, or it would be more than three weeks, we're not doing this week, but a couple of three talks back. We talked about Ishbosheth, who was one of uh, Saul's sons who was installed as king, but he was murdered in his bed. And so he's not there, back in 2 Samuel 4, verse 6. Um, and so, all, as far as David's concerned, all of sons, uh, Saul's sons are dead, but he just wondered if anybody left in the house at all. It's not that David just wanted to show love and kindness, you know, but he made that promise to Jonathan, back in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14. He, he, he'd made this promise that he would show kindness right down the generations to any one of Jonathan's family that he possibly could. And so in verse 1, he's sort of saying this, that, is there anyone I may show kindness to the house of Saul for Jonathan's sake? Because he'd made this promise to Jonathan. And, uh, you know, it, it, he isn't actually sort of just saying, um, just Jonathan's family would be Saul's family. Anyone left of the house of Saul, who, and Saul, as I said, had been his enemy as well. But he wanted to show a kindness. And eventually, as you go through there, you see there's this um, servant, this man called Ziba. Uh, he's found. And he, he had authority in the house of Saul. And uh, he's brought before David and he's questioned. Um, now, know how things would turn out usually, and how kings uh, usually behaved back in those days. They would destroy all of their. Uh, the opposition from any other uh, body who had a claim to the throne. Um, you would have thought that Ziba would be a little bit careful with his words. <coughs> we would think he should keep quiet. Remember how when Herod had a th threat to his throne, he heard about the new king born of the Jews, he killed all the little children when he was heard about the birth of the Lord Jesus. But Ziba uh, doesn't really keep his mouth shut. He says, in Lodabar there is a man. In Lodabar, right now, Zibra is not really a very reliable sort of chap, and um, as we get to chapter 16 to 19, we'll see a little bit more about um, Zibra, but he was not probably one of the best people. But here he is, and he's, he comes before the Lord, and he says, to, he, comes before, he comes before David and says, um, At your service, he, he comes in as a servant. He basically hasn't got the option, he has to take that line of, line of uh, thought as well. Now, Lodabar, he says, Look, there is a servant of the household whose name was Zibra. When they called him to David, he said to him, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. And the king said, is there not someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who was lame in his feet. I should think that made David's heart jump as well. The son of Jonathan? 
And so the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he's in the house of Nethel, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Lodabar is a place of nothing. It's a place of no bread, nothing much would grow there. It was not a good place. And it was here that Mephibosheth was sort of, he lived in the house of this man, Mekur, the son of Amiel, and it was in this home, to this home, that David sent um, maybe a troop of soldiers to go and catch him, to, or not catch him, to uh, escort him back to, the, to David's palace, David's home. Um, it was a place where, you know, not, not, the, not a choice place where, you know, might have a, I don't want to say bandits, but, you know, those who are living a little bit out of society would go and live there. And I would imagine that this is uh, why Mephibosheth was there. He wanted to keep out of the eyes of David. He wanted to be in the background and just possibly get on with his life the best he could. And so it says uh, this troop is sent, uh, the authorities come and they knock on the door. There's a bang on the door and obviously this Mekir must have gone to answer it. And uh, the king wants to see Mephibosheth. The king wants Mephibosheth. And then Mephibosheth must have trembled. He must have been terrified at this news, right? He's probably sitting on a mat or something like that. He would have been helpless. There's nothing he could do about it. You know, after all these years of just living a, a low-key life and surviving, uh, Dave has discovered where he is. And everything looks grim from Mephibosheth, right? Um, Dave has found him. Maybe, as far as he's concerned, his life is going to come to an end now. Dave has eventually managed to root him out. And he, had, he probably thinks to himself, this is all rather unfair. None of this is my doing. I've had a bit of a rough life. I thought I was just going to cruise through the last few days in the state that I'm in. And now I've been rumbled and this is the end of it. What a way to finish my life. And I suppose Mephibosheth was, was right. Life hadn't been particularly fair to him, had it? Um, it started out, if you think about it, it started out really well. He was uh, a prince, wasn't he? His father, his grand, grandfather was the king. He would have been a prince, really. Jonathan, his father, was definitely a prince and possibly he would have been a king. Um, he was royalty. This Mephibosheth was royalty, really. And that brought many privileges. And at one stage, until he was five years old, life was good. But as we read, that had all come, that all changed, all come to an end that changed when he was just a little boy when, because of what happened on Mount Gilbert, his nurse ran away with it. There'd been a tripping over, whether it was him or his nurse who fell over. Um, he, he'd become a cripple because of that fall. And, you know, you imagine that when you were a young lad. You know, your grandfather, your father had passed away. The Philistines were coming. Absolute terror. And that kind of terror must be running through his mind again as he gets his sons to appear before King David. I suppose when he was young, he couldn't really understand what was going on. Everything was in a panic, the people shouting and, you know, running, grabbing and all kinds of things going on. But now, it's basically just him, he's on his own, he's got to face up to this. And there's nothing he can do. He hasn't got legs to be able to run away. And, you know, he couldn't do anything. Last time his, his uh, maid would probably hold him and ran until maybe she stumbled. But my finish is stuck, isn't he? His legs are useless. And... Uh, <laughs> He just can't obey the situation. He's, this, is, this is a person who had to be cared for by other people now. Everybody who would have cared for him had passed away. And now the king wants him. The king wants him in his presence. And he was frightened. He was probably angry as well. It was clear that Ziba, who took care of him, or who had responsibility, had betrayed him. And there was nothing that this Mephibosheth could do about his situation. His legs, his legs didn't work. He couldn't run away. And he had to go where he was going to be taken. And so you can imagine that the, the troops would have come in and they would have put an arm or a hand under each shoulder and lifted him up and um, put him in a chariot. And uh, then the journey back to the, uh, the uh, palace or David's home would take place. And so you look at, you look at um, verse 6. This is a, the Mephibosheth sort of arrives at the scene. Can you sort of imagine this? crippled man, right, being brought before the throne of the king. And he's lying prostrate before David. <coughs> he, came, he comes in total humility. There's nothing else he can do. It's a bit like the prodigal son, isn't it, when he comes to his senses and he wants to go back to his father. And he says, look, I'm not fit to be anything other than a servant in your sight. Just allow me to come home. I'm no longer worthy. And, and this is the situation that Mephibosheth is in. In James 4.10 it says, and humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. 
the Lord will lift you up if you come to him humbly. And this is exactly what happens to Mephibosheth. He comes terrified, he comes humbly before David, <coughs> and he says, look, here is your servant. And this is Mephibosheth, who was, you know, basically royalty at one stage. And all he did depend on is the mercy of David. And um, I was reading a, a, a book a while ago about one of Napoleon's soldiers, and, and there's a young boy of 19 who was found asleep as a, uh, in, in the service of Napoleon. He fell asleep and he was due to be sentenced to death and the boy's mother managed to get an audience with Napoleon. And she pled for the boy's life. She came and said, please spare my son. Um, please, you know, can you, can you sort of grant him some mercy? And, and Napoleon said to the woman, why do your son uh, think he uh, de deserves mercy? Why should I be merciful for him? She said, he doesn't deserve it because if he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. But can you just be merciful? You see, Mephibosheth didn't deserve mercy, but David was going to be merciful to him. It wasn't something that Mephibosheth deserved. In the normal run of things, he would have been put to death. But he received mercy because of a promise. He received mercy because of a covenant. And I would imagine that he can hardly believe his ears when he hears David's response. Because when David says to him, look, don't fear for I will show you kindness for Jonathan your father's sake and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather and you shall eat bread at my table continually. One moment he thinks he's, this is it, the sword's going to fall, he's going to be dead, that's the end of him, and the next minute he's hearing these words of it's, it's better than winning the lottery. Everything's gone completely far beyond his greatest expectations. I don't think he could believe his ears, the past's forgotten. He's not asked to pay for anything. Everything that was his grandfather's is going to be restored to him. All the land that belonged to his grandfather. And he's going to eat at the king's table forever. He's going to eat at David's table forever. And this was all done not for anything that Mephibosheth could or would or have done at all. But it was all being done for him. And he just had to accept it as a gift. It was just coming to him as a gift. And he, he finds it hard to believe. And he bowed himself and he said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? Now, when I was in Romania, there used to be dead dogs all over the place. The dogs used to roam in packs and they'd be hit by cars and they just laid on the side of the road and rotted away. They were given no concern whatsoever, which I thought was quite uh, a shame, really. But they're, they're just irrelevant to society. And in Jewish culture, a dog was a, a, low, a lowly animal and a dead dog was totally worthless. And he says, you know, what is it that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? He cast himself as nothing. And as if it's not possible, really. We can't think of ourselves as a dead dog, can we? We can't think of anything sort of more worthless than that. But probably feel, you know, uh, we feel better than a dead dog. We may even think that God should be grateful that we've come to him, that we, we, um, we believe in him, that we look to him for, for certain things in our lives, that God should be sort of, a, you know, really encouraged by our behaviour. But you know, it's not until we truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that we understand just what we're being forgiven of, that we realise really how worthless we are and what he's done for us. And just how unworthy we are to receive it. Mephibosheth's pardon was so great, he could hardly believe it. And David's forgiveness that transports Mephibosheth from fear and trembling one moment, he's terrified one minute, and the next minute, he's got security and peace. It's a huge movement, isn't it? And that's exactly what the Lord does for those who come to him. He moves us from a, a situation of darkness into light, from hope, hopelessness into complete hope and assurity with him. From peace and trembling to security and peace. And then verse 9, like, and the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given all your master, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house, all the property that belonged to Saul, not all of Israel, but the lands that belonged to Saul. I've given them to your master's son. Yeah, he, he's going to provide for Mephibosheth's needs. They have to be met. He, he would have to be reclothed. He's going to live in the court now, David. He needs some finance. He's going to live in, in David's house. Yeah, he's going to sit there at the table and dine with David. He needs to be um, cared for. And I like to think that as he sits at the table of David, I know probably they don't have a table and chairs like we do, but if he sits at David's table, then 
his crippled legs would be hidden by the tablecloth. He's just been restored to a wonderful position, hasn't he? In Philippians 4.19 we read this, My God shall supply all needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And this is, you know, this is just what's happened to Mephibosheth. Everything that you could possibly need, everything you want or desire, is being taken care of because of the covenant that was made by John and his father with David. He's gone. Look at verse 10. He says, look, Therefore, your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, your master's son shall eat bread at my table always. And now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Suddenly, Mephibosheth has got a huge workforce working for him to provide for him. And, you know, he's gone from being a lodger in somebody's house to being a courtyard with the king. From little to plenty. He's gone from Lodibar, a place of nothingness, to the king's table. He's been transported to there, right? It says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, that eyes not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And this must have been the case with Mephibosheth, must not it? It must have been. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. So Ziba had to be obedient to the king's command. And there will come a time, you know, there's going to come a time when we all have to obey the king's command. We'll all have to come before the king and obey his command. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And it will be better, you know, if you come and bow before Jesus as a friend rather than a judge. As your saviour rather than a judge. You know, today God's commandments, by and large, are sort of treated as fairy tales. People ignore them. But one day, and I don't believe it's too far away from where we are today, all those who refuse the Lord's invitation, all those who won't accept his authority, all those who don't think that he is going to be a judge, will be judged by him and by the statutes that he's put in place in his word. See, they had to obey the king. One day, everybody will bow the knee everybody will have to obey the king. And then we get to verses um, 12 and 13. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all those who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem for he ate continually at the king's table. And he was lame in both his feet. He was adopted as a son. He came to David's family like a son. Yeah? He, was, he was one of the part of the king's family. Just remember how Joseph was transported from being in the prison or a slave into the prison to become Prime Minister of Egypt. God moved him through that progress. This is exactly what's happened to Mephibosheth. Now we may sometimes think we feel like a worthless one before God, but God doesn't think of us like that. He never thinks of you or me as a worthless one. There was an old um, Cornish evangelist called Billy Bray. You may have heard of him, you may have read about him. But he used to walk miles and miles and miles to to take church services, to preach the gospel. And somebody asked him, why is it that you can so enthusiastically walk so far to take a service? He said, each step, he says, it's like I'm saying, glory, glory, I'm a son of the king. You see, in Galatians 4, verse 4, it says, but when the fullness of time was come, right, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons, that we might become the sons of God. Can you believe that? We might not be known by the King of England, but if we love our Lord, then we're known by the King of Heaven. And we're his sons and daughters. daughters you know, we've been adopted by him. We belong to him. It's a little story that I read here. I'm going to read it to you. It's written by a man called William Barclay about soldiers, a group of soldiers during World War II who lost a friend in battle. They want to give their fallen comrades a decent burial, so they found a church with a graveyard behind it surrounded by a white fence, and then they found the parish priest that said, would it be okay if um, our friend was buried in your churchyard? And he says, was he a Catholic? The priest inquired. No, he wasn't, said the soldiers. I'm sorry, said the priest, but our graveyard is reserved for members of the Holy Catholic Church. But you can bury your friend just outside the graveyard, on the other side of the fence, and I will make sure that his grave is cared for. And so, with grateful hearts, the soldiers said okay, and they proceeded to bury their friend just outside the graveyard. 
and then they had to return back to the war zone. When the war, when the war finally ended, uh, they decided they would visit their friend's grave before they returned home. They remembered the location of the church, and they remembered the grave, and they remembered the fence, and they searched everywhere, but they couldn't find it. They couldn't find the grave anywhere. So finally, they go in and they speak to the, the parish priest and say, we cannot find um, our, soldiers, our, our soldier friend's grave. Have, have you moved it? Have you moved the grave? Well, answered the priest, he said, after you buried your fallen friend, it just didn't seem to me that it was right that he should be buried there outside the fence. So you moved his grave, asked the soldier. You moved his grave. Where have you moved it? No, said the priest, I didn't move his grave. I moved the fence. You see, and that's what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. He's moved the fence to include you and me. You know, we're part of the family. The fence has been moved. It's an incredible thing, isn't it? That God would do that for the likes of you and me. You know, we don't deserve to go to heaven. You know, but God has mercifully moved the fence to include us so that we can. And now, you know, it's up to us. I wonder as we just, because time's going by, but how do you feel about that this morning? How do you feel about what we just thought about there this morning? You know, are you ashamed? Do you keep sort of rejecting God? Do you feel like a dead dog? I don't know how you feel before the Lord. See, the, the whole point of this little chapter here is God's mercy. David's true mercy, but it's, he's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to the likes of you and me. Um, it, it's mercy and love. You know, 1 John 3, verse 1, we read this. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. We all have the opportunity to become the sons of God. If you haven't made that decision today, then you seriously need to make, you know, steps in the right direction. Challenge your heart. Think about it. It's a wonderful promise that's available to all those who choose to put their trust in the Lord Jesus. Make him the Lord of your life if you haven't already done so. We sing a hymn. We sing it on a regular basis. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. And that's exactly what this is about. Jesus does. He loves us, even though we're not worthy. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it, as we go through this, of God's grace in the Christian life towards each one of us. Just like the Mephibosheth, where we're lame. In so many ways, we're lame. We're crippled by sin and both feet. We're unable to move ourselves. We're unable to do anything. You know, we're unable to cover our shame and our sin. We're unable to provide for ourselves, to move our situation. But because of the, the love and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his blood shed for us that we remember this morning, we've been brought from Lodabar, a place of nothingness, into the presence of God. We have a home in heaven. The Bible says that we are citizens of heaven. We become citizens of heaven. Now, just as you know, David extended his mercy to Mephibosheth, so God's extended his mercy to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's extended an extraordinary mercy to us. You know, it's extraordinary. It's a wonderful kindness. And it's something that's completely undeserved. Not one of us can say we deserve it. We've earned it. We've been invited to eat at the king's table, not just communion, but his table forever and ever. To dine with him forever and ever. One day we'll sit at the king's table in heaven if he belongs to us and we belong to him. And we'll share that forever and ever. We'll sit at the king's table, we'll be in glory. What a day that will be. Undeserved. Yet through the love and the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's unbelievable grace and unbelievable mercy. And each one of us is invited to share in it. But first of all, you have to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. As the verse says, you must be born again. And that's the crucial thing. We have to give our hearts and lives to the Lord Jesus. The moment we do that, His Spirit comes into us and we're spiritually born again. We become part of His family, His Son, His daughter, and we can die at His table with Him. Amen. Amen. We've got one more song to get to finish with, haven't we?
Fellowship, and as we go to our homes, watch over as we pray, Lord, until we can meet together. 